Good evening, everyone. My name is David Target. I am one of the graduate assistants in the Office of Gift Planning, and I have with us today Mr. Richard Lewis. How are you today? I'm fine, sir. How are you? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I'm doing well. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, to get us started, um, can you kind of just like introduce yourself to uh, our McCallans and Lachlans and let them know who you are and uh, a little bit about your time at St. John's? Sure, not a problem. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, whenever you're watching this. My name is Richard Lewis. I am a proud native New Yorker, and I attended St. John's University from 1989 to 1993. At the time, I attended St. Vincent's College, which I'm quite sure now is the College of Professional Studies. Mm -hmm. And at the time when I got to St. John's, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So I started off in Associates and Paralegal Studies, and I kind of jumped around majors here and there. And then maybe in my second year, I made the decision to get my Bachelor of Science in Athletic Administration. Mm -hmm. And then my minor was in Communication Arts. And so I graduated on time after four years. And got that 3.0 after I did my got all my A's in my 18 credit internship and uh I love my time at St. John's yeah I mean I've, I've enjoyed my time it's really fantastic um and so when you were at St. John's I was looking at your LinkedIn I saw you were you did some extracurriculars where you were a part of the uh, WSJU radio and the the publication on campus called the torch can you uh talk a little bit about what those were like during your time at St. John's, they've evolved quite a bit now, but. Sure, when I was, uh, when I was at St. John's, I, you know, you do the orientation, the freshman orientation like you always do. And what really caught my eye, the one organization I joined was WSJU Radio. At the time it was in the old university center and it was carry a current just um, having, having a signal on campus if you could find it. <laughs> but I'm quite sure with streaming and everything now, it's probably stuff that, you could, that I probably could even get down here in Florida. But when I was at WSJU, I started off as an on-air personality, did the DJ training and the on-air personality thing, and I continued to be involved in what they were doing, became assistant program director. And in my senior year, I became general manager of the radio station. And in that senior year, that was um, 92, 93. Mm -hmm. In spring of 93, we fixed, uh, the university fixed up the fourth floor of Marillac Hall, and that was the that was the year that we moved from the University Center to Marillac Hall. And I think the unit the radio station's been at Marillac Hall ever since. Mm -hmm. At the time at the Torch, I wrote a an op-ed column called Talking Sports, which was which was named after one of the specialty shows that we did at WSJU. So I used to always write different opinions and columns about professional sports, and certainly about um, the Red Men at the time, now Red Storm. And I would always do some sort of sports trivia to try to stump, to try to stump the crowd. And then there was always one professor who was always, I think it was Professor Gerstner. So I don't know if he's still there any longer, but he used to always be able to answer the questions and he would go back and forth and, um, and give me some of his questions as well. So this is long before the internet and social media. We actually had to write to each other and send it through in our office mail. But um, my time at the Torch, one of the people that was at WSJU, she convinced me to write for the torch as well. So I did that op-ed and she helped me with the editing and made my made my simple writing sound extraordinary. Um, but that time at WSJU and at the torch, I really had an opportunity not only to meet a lot of great people that were there, but also people who were involved in student union, people who were involved in student government, people involved in Haraya, because all those organizations at the time used to be together at the university center. And that really was the binding force, those friendships, that still lasts today. I keep in touch with still a lot of people today via social media, and those friendships really sustained my time and made my time at St. John's that much more enjoyable. Right. That sounds awesome. And I mean, the I know that they still have it on the the fourth floor in Marillac, and there um, they've kind of renovated the space a little. I know they updated like the production uh, facility, like we were talking about earlier, and. Um, they also now have Red TV, which is, I guess, St. John's own little production area where um, they're giving students who are focused on like journalism and production the opportunity to get, I guess, real world experience, and which is really awesome to see stuff. That like was that. really awesome to see. I saw they remember. I remember they had the TV club when I was there, and I remember taking a television production class when we had to go into the production studio and do all the editing and learn how to fade. Like you said, I'm quite sure the studio looks. 10 million times better than it did then. And it was nice back then as well. 
So, so you you fin- you graduated from St. John's in '93. Um, yes. Uh, what, what did you go on to do after St. John's? After St. John's, I went on to, I left out of state and I went to Atlanta, Georgia, where I started graduate school at Clark Atlanta University. And then of course, uh, and of course it's a uh, life takes you on a whirlwind. So at that, during my time there, I had, um, I had met the person who would become my wife and then become my ex-wife. And, and when I was still, a, when I was still a kid myself, probably not too much older, not too much older than you or too much younger than you, I became a father for the first time. And then we figured it's so nice to do it twice and become a father again. So I, I became a father of two children. And then, um, then, and, but unfortunately after we got our divorce, I, I, I came back to New York, you know, my mother was still there at the time. And then I made myself, I got, I brought myself down or, Came, made my way down to South Florida when I kind of got into education by accident, where I started doing on uh, substitute teaching in Miami-Dade public schools, mm-hmm. and then I became a substitute teacher, and then I became a regular teacher, and then I came back to New York, and then and then came then came back to Florida again, and then when I got my footing down here in Florida, um, well, I skipped one thing. After Atlanta, I went to Detroit. And that's where I finished my mass, my first master's degree program. I got my MA in sports management mm-hmm. um, from Wayne State University in Detroit. And then I came back to New York and then of course came to Florida. And then in the midst of um, going back and forth between New York and Florida, I eventually came back to Florida permanently. Um, but when I was in my last iteration in New York, I worked as a family services specialist for the Fortune Society, which is a nonprofit organization that helps people with criminal justice convictions or criminal justice histories return from re- returning from incarceration and helping them reintegrate into mainstream society. So I did a lot of work with that. And then um, when I came back to Florida, I went back into higher education. I worked as an admissions counselor for Kaiser University. And then I went on to work at Broward College. I got a job as an advisor there. And I've been now, this year will make 13 years. I've been at Broward. And in that time I've been at Broward, I got a second master's degree. I got my MBA in human resources from Nova Southeastern University. And then I got my doctor of education in organizational leadership from Nova Southeastern University. And I did my dissertation on concentrating on people coming back from incarceration and rebuilding their lives. Um, So now I continue to work at the college. I run student services for our bachelor's program in business here at at Broward College. And I also am an adjunct professor teaching a lot of the human resources courses in that program. I also um, run a podcast. I do I do a podcast called Second Chance Coaching, which you can find on many of the podcasting streams that you listen to, iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, and probably tons of other places that I can't <laughs> that I can't remember. And um, so I do I do that, and now I'm continuing to do more in the space of criminal justice reform and advocacy, as far as helping people come home, helping people get get those um, opportunities. And really looking to see how we could we could fix a system that is more concentrated on punitive measures than rehabilitative and restorative and second chances and you know the name of my podcast and those those are the spaces in which I'm in right now. Um, I'm proud of the fact my daughter is a is a is a grand young lady. She's 26 years old and she lives in New Orleans, Louisiana. She's a fourth and fifth grade social studies and a language arts teacher. Um, unfortunately, going on five years ago, um, my son um, passed away. He was a victim of gun violence, so he passed away five years ago. But he's still an angel that we keep in our hearts and our minds all the time. And that's, I guess that's the Reader's Digest version of what 28 years has been like, going on 28 years leaving St. John's. <laughs> that is one heck of a journey, I will tell you that. Um, so just to quickly summarize, how many, how many degrees are we working with here? I have one, two, three, I have four. I have my BS from St. John's, my MA from Wayne State University, my MBA from Nova Southeastern University, and my EDD from Nova Southeastern University. Are we done? Are we done or are we getting more? Uh, we're, sometimes you, you're never done, but you know, I'm taking a couple of classes to get credentials here and there. So you're never done, done, but you know you you try not to you try not to go as deep as you can. I figured it's you know we're in the pandemic. You can take a couple of classes, get credential, get your get your skills going here and there, 
you know, you, you, you'll you see when you when you get close to me, I'll be 50 this year. I can't believe I said that out loud, but I'll be 50 this year. So you, you, you look to expand your wings and see what else you could do. So for the most part, I think I'm done, but you know, you never know. <laughs> Um, so you, one of the things that you mentioned in there was uh, when one of the things I wanted to talk about was how you're the, the founder and president of uh, Spring Heights Associates, which, like you said, provides life skills and leadership development for returning citizens who are coming either from incarceration or those with a criminal justice, uh, justice history, um, seeking sustainable employment, as well as transitioning back into mainstream society. And this was actually um, one of the things that I was taught in one of my sociology classes during my senior year at St. John's. Um, my professor had us read one of his books and I, I forget the name, but um, it talked about what you're working on and how you said right now, uh, our justice system is inherently punitive in nature as opposed to reformative, um, which is something I wanted to talk you, to you about because um, from what I was reading and what I studied with that book was, um, other countries around the world, um, I believe the book spoke a lot about, um, I believe it was the Netherlands, um, how they have a very reformative uh, justice system where people aren't necessarily punished for their, I mean, they are punished, obviously, but it's, it's more restorative. Um, is that kind of how you, is that what you envision our justice system transitioning to over the next couple of years? I could definitely see our justice system transitioning to a restorative justice model, such as what you see in, in the Netherlands and other countries like that that have, that have done that. I think what blocks it from that is a lot of times people have fear as to what that means. They figure that, you know, well, if you, if you coddle people, they're going to sit there and keep on making mistakes. They're going to keep on doing this. They're going to keep on offending. They'll keep on being a threat to society. And I could get that point. But then here's the point. We've been doing it in a punitive way all this time. And here's what we do know. Crime hasn't gone away. Crime hasn't been eliminated off the face of the earth. We fear. We're still afraid of different things. So these things are not. So what we're doing is not working, you know, and we're, we're incarcerating people at a rate where um, we're incarcerating people for the for for crimes that normally would not have been not have been um, punished. We are over sentencing people is disproportionately affecting people of color. And when we look at a restorative form of justice and alternatives to incarceration, I think the pandemic and the last summer of civil unrest has really put shine, shone a light on that, that the momentum is building to say, you know what, the way in which we incarcerate, the way in which we, we do corrections, the way in which we do rehabilitation and look towards doing a restorative justice model is really changing. And, and I think that ultimately, when you look at a situation where you say, okay, you know what, I want people who are coming home or people who have done something wrong. Of course, you, we're not saying to escape from accountability or responsibility, but the way in which we punish, the way in which we restore, the way in which we allow people to come back and say, do what it is that you need to do in order so you could be a taxpayer, you could be a contributor. As I speak to you, you know, my son's case, when he was murdered, that case has not been solved. That case is still a cold case. But even when the time happened, when he was, when he was, when he, when he passed away, I still said to people that, you know, whoever did or whoever did that to him, him, them, she, whoever, mm -hmm. I said, I already forgive them. And it not means that I don't want them to stand up and be accountable for what they did. But I want them to say, okay, you know what? Be accountable for what you did, but also have the ability that whatever, whatever society deems as an appropriate punishment is handed out and they're out, then, get, then, they sh then even them, even them who, who took the life of my son, who they can, they can never restore anything back to me short of bringing him back. I still believe that those, that, that person or those people would deserve that second chance to restore their lives. So you know what, if they restore their lives, that means if they're given the opportunity to work and do the things that they do, that means that my son is gone, but maybe someone else's loved one won't, 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 be, won't fall victim to, to them or someone else. So ultimately, you know, looking at, looking at a restorative model of justice, I think not only is, it, is better for, for us as a society or people who've been victims of crime, 
or even people who've been directly impacted as being incarcerated or formerly incarcerated individual, I think that just helps that just helps us all. It's, it's a benefit to all of us. Right, right. I completely understand. Um, and I think it's important that we have conversations like this where we can we can just talk like talk about this and and see what the how to move forward in, in the right direction towards um, making society better as a whole. Um, so, I mean, so can you talk a little bit about um, how, how you help um, people, uh, citizens return from either incarceration or having a criminal justice history? Sure. Um, when I when someone gets in contact with me in regards to saying they're looking for help or see what it is that they could do, sometimes they come to me and help either through my regular nine to five job at the college and people know what my interests are and what I do. So they will send those students to me or even in my own personal consulting and coaching business when I work with when I work with individuals. The good thing is not every one case is, is alike. So there's always there's always a different nuance as far as how to work with someone. But for example, if someone's looking to work, get a new job. So, you know, we'll, we'll do things like, okay, let's, let's talk about how would you do an interview? How do you present yourself in an interview? How do you talk about your criminal justice offense without it being a, um, a highlight, but just, but just say, okay, this is what I did, but this is what I'm doing now. This is how I've restored myself. So you always speak in humanizing and restorative language. So I take people through those exercises. At the same time too, I also coach and work with companies that are that are seeing, okay, well, we are employing or looking to employ formerly incarcerated individuals, or maybe they're not targeting that, but they see that one in four people in the United States have, had, have been arrested or incarcerated in one way, shape or form. So if 25% of our big country is in that position, it's highly likely you may either employ or find people that are in that situation. So I also talk to companies and colleges and universities as far as saying when you are when you are employing or bringing on returning citizens as being your students, how is it that you speak to them in a humanizing way? How is it that you deal with them to say, we welcome you into our community? So there's a community of restoration, of reinvigoration, a community in which you could thrive in your career, a community where you could thrive in the in the academic pursuits that you're pursuing, and look to see how we could do that. So really, it's me just going through those exercises with the with the person that's coming home. It could be videotaping them. Maybe how do you interview on a Zoom call? When what's your body language look like when you're when you're speaking of your offense and your restoration and things of that nature. How do you easily transition from one step to another? How do you put together a resume? How do you make sure that when you answer, have you ever been convicted? Do you say, you check it off and how do you explain it? And how do you, how do you project yourself and market yourself appropriately? And so in working with them and in working with institutions, it's really designed overall. It could, every case could be different, but overall it's really designed to inject humanizing language, humanizing and uplifting and restorative language in a tone that can be both beneficial to the institution that's receiving the individual and the individual that's seeking either employment or education or even seeking entrepreneurial opportunities. Right. I think I think it's important that we have organizations like yours, uh, Springfield Heights Associates, because um, I feel like it's, I, I could be wrong, but I feel like it's assumed that people who have this um, a history of incarceration or a criminal justice history um, inherently know, I guess, things like building a resume or how to interact over Zoom or how to market themselves appropriately. I think it's important to have uh, institutions of education like yours that, that allow people to, to better society and not cause further harm to society. No, of course. I mean, we we do that here. Um, we do that, you know, at Springfield Heights. We do that through the Second Chance program that we that we do. Um, we do it at the college that I work at now, at Broward College. And 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 I know that the Vincentian mission that we that we have at St. John's is something that we do at St. John's as well. That we look at saying, okay, you know what? Let's let let's let's talk about forgiveness. Let's talk about second chances. Let's talk about the ability to restore and be better and say that, you know what, a chapter in your book is not the whole book, it's just a chapter or right. a sentence or a paragraph, whatever it is, because the, the journey 
the, th the thing that goes along the journey or the way you take along the, the way you go along your journey doesn't define where you're going to end up. And the thing is, if you keep on going up, if you keep on going all the way up, you're restoring, you're doing better, then that's something that's, that's a celebration. That's, that's a celebration for all of us. Right. But if someone falls through the cracks and we lose them, then, then that's on, then that's all of us as well, because if we're going to incarcerate and if we're going to hold people accountable and hold them responsible for the things in which they do, now, mind you, it's another a conversation as to how we do that, but certainly my conversation is not how we do that. But when we look at how we restore and how we give people the ability to say that when you return, you get the full rights of citizenship. You get to work. You get to vote. You get to rent an apartment or buy a house. You get to buy a car and have a credit card. You know, those are the kind of things you get to go to school and then you be in communities such as what I try to create in my environment, what I try to create at Broward College, what I know is there at St. John's University because I, because I know that the Vincentian spirit at St. John's is really about giving and about, about helping your fellow man and really being in a situation where, where you are your brother's keeper. And that's something that even though it's something that you hear and it's always said to you when you were at St. John's, it's really something that those echoes and those voices in your head that came from that, that were planted at, while you were at St. John's, they have echoed so much in the 27 or close to 28 years since I last walked the halls at St. John's. Those are things that, that stay with you. And those are things that you always want to do as far as helping someone out. Right. And you said that um, when you were at St. John's, you really didn't know what you wanted to do. But I guess it sounds like that the, the Vincentian mission that St. John's University embodies, I guess, had an impact on you without you actually knowing it. And now it has led you down this career path of, of making uh, the world a better place. Oh yeah, I, I didn't know it as well. And getting into education and getting into this field is almost, um, it's almost the, uh, I, I think I became an accidental tourist. I know that's a movie that's before your time, but, but if you look it up, you'll see it. Um, you, you, you know, sometimes you intend to do one thing and then something else happens all the way around the board. And, and you know, even with the, even with the turbulence that, that, that all of us experience in life, sometimes you say to yourself, you know, oh, I wish I wouldn't have had this. I wish I didn't have to go through this. I wish I didn't have to go through that. But going through the tough times is what got me to the times where I'm at now. And even where I'm at now, I'm still growing. I'm still doing better. I'm still saying, let me do what it is that we have to do to help someone out. And you're right. The Fincentian mission at St. John's is something that, that, that carried with me while I was there. You know, you do certain things when you're there as far as, you know, helping out and doing the things that, that we usually do in service. But really, it's something that carries with you so much. I mean, and, and I think that that mission and what St. John's put into you, you don't realize how much it stays with you really until you're out of the environment. You take, you take for granted when you're there, as always being said, it's always being reinforced. But you don't really realize the type of seeds it has planted until once you have graduated. Exactly. Um, and I know you said that um, you, you have obviously a lot to talk about regarding this issue. And you said it's a conversation for the another day. But I will, I will definitely um, link uh, your podcast um, to this YouTube video in the, in the description below, as well as in the e-newsletter that will be sent out to um, our McCallans and Lachlans. But I just want to thank uh, Mr. Richard Lewis for taking the time today to be a part of our Ask Alumni feature. I, this is an important conversation that um, I'm sure our McCallans and Lachlans will certainly enjoy listening to. So thank you again. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And we are St. John's. Yes. Go Johnnies. <laughs> That's right. <laughs>